Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing integral domains. Okay, so in this next video, what I want to do is tell you about two more basic but important theorems about integral domains. Okay, so the first one is that if you take an integral domain and you produce the polynomial ring over that integral domain, i.e. with coefficients in that integral domain, uh, then that new polynomial ring over the integral domain that you've produced will also be an integral domain. Okay, so let me write this out here then. So let's say d here is our integral domain, so I'll put d is an integral domain, and I'll abbreviate integral domain down to id here, okay? Then my claim is that if we generate the polynomial ring with coefficients in that integral domain, so if we generate d adjoin x here, or d uh, square brackets x here, uh, this is an integral domain, so dx is an integral domain as well. Okay, so this being true implies that this is also true. Okay, so why is that going to be the case then? Okay, so if d here is an integral domain, then it's the case that if you multiply two non-zero elements, you will not get zero back again. So what I want to prove to prove that this is an integral domain is, if, is that if I take two non-zero polynomials, so let's say I take ax and bx, okay, which are both non-zero polynomials, so let's say ax and bx are both non-zero polynomials from my polynomial ring uh, over the integral domain d, okay, uh, then I want to prove that if I multiply these two together, it's also going to be a non-zero polynomial. Okay, and I'll just put actually here that it's not uh, the zero polynomial. So it's an element of the uh, ring of polynomials subtract the zero polynomial. So both of these are not the zero polynomial. Then I want to now prove that if I multiply these two together in the ring of polynomials, if I take ax and I multiply it by b of x, okay, I want to prove that this is not equal to the zero polynomial. Okay, so how can I do this? Well, the important point here is that if these two polynomials are not the zero polynomial, then they have some leading coefficient that is not equal to zero. Okay, so for ax here then, let's say that the leading coefficient is an, and it's in front of x to the power of n. Okay, so there has to be some leading coefficient which is not zero. Okay, so an is not equal to zero in the uh, integral domain d. Okay, uh, so here is our leading coefficient which has, uh, well, which is not the zero, okay, uh, which is not equal to zero. And of course, it could be the case that it's a constant polynomial, in which case the leading coefficient will just be the constant term, but at the very least, that constant term cannot be equal to zero, otherwise it will be equal to the zero polynomial. And the same is true of bx here. B of x will have some leading coefficient which will have as bm here, and that will be in front of x to the power of m here. And again, bm will not be equal to zero in our initial integral domain here. Now, when I multiply these two polynomials together, the leading coefficient now of the answer here, a of x multiplied by b of x, will be a n multiplied by b m, where they're multiplied together in the integral domain, and then that will be in front of x to the n plus m here. So this will be our new uh, leading term, basically. And this will be our new leading coefficient here, a n times b n. Now, if both of these are not equal to zero in the initial integral domain, which was my initial assumption, because they were the leading coefficients, which were not equal to zero, then we know that when we multiply them together, because we're working with an integral domain, we'll get some non-zero element. Okay, so a n times b n will no longer well, well, will not equal zero because we were working with an initial integral domain. And that means that this polynomial is now not going to be the zero polynomial because its leading coefficient here is not equal to zero. Okay, and therefore it cannot have all coefficients equal to zero. Okay, so when you multiply together two non-zero polynomials in this ring of polynomials over an integral domain, you will not get the zero polynomial back again. You'll get a non-zero uh, polynomial back again. So indeed, this ring of polynomials over an integral domain is also an integral domain. And of course, I should stress that when you take a commutative ring, this integral domain will be a commutative ring. When you take the ring of polynomials over a commutative ring, you get a commutative ring back again. And also, if this was the non-zero ring, this will not be the zero ring either. Okay, so um, 
the other two conditions, you know, translate onto this ring of polynomials as well, so that it does indeed satisfy all three conditions of an integral domain. Okay, so that's theorem number one that I wanted to tell you about. The next thing that I want to tell you about is um, a little bit of a further investigation to something that I pointed out in the previous video. Now, in the previous video, I showed you that the multiplication table of an integral domain is special because all of the rows and all of the columns that correspond to non-zero elements in the integral domain have to contain no repeats, okay? They cannot contain an element of the integral domain more than once. Okay, now, um, in the case that the integral domain was finite, I pointed out that that would mean that every single row and every single column corresponding to a non-zero element in this multiplication table would have to contain every single element of the domain once and only once. Okay, that didn't have to hold true if it was uh, an infinite integral domain. Now, uh, I'm going to investigate that further because what that is actually going to mean is that if we have a finite integral domain, so if we have a finite integral domain d, then I claim that a finite integral domain is actually equal to a field. So the finite integral domains are all fields. There is no such thing as a finite integral domain that is not a field. Okay, if you're an integral domain and you're finite, then you are also a field. This does not hold true for infinite integral domains. If you've got an infinite integral domain, then it is not necessarily a field. The example being the integers. The integers is an infinite integral domain, uh, but it is not a field. It does not have a multiplicative inverse for two, for instance. Okay, so why is this the case? Well, this is really, really simple to understand. I have now said that if we, for instance, well, actually, let's just say what we need to prove here. We need to show that if I take A, which is an element of my integral domain, and I'll just move this up a bit. So if I take A, which is an element of my integral domain, and A is not equal to the zero element, so it's not equal to the additive identity. So I take some arbitrary element in my integral domain that's not the additive identity. I need to show that there's also a multiplicative inverse. So there is 1 over A, which is in the integral domain, such that A times 1 over A is going to equal the multiplicative identity 1. So I have to show that there exists another element in the integral domain which multiplies by a to give 1. Now, why is that going to have to be the case? Well, I've said it, basically. Uh, if we look at the row corresponding to a here, it will have to contain every single element of the finite integral domain once and only once. There's no other option. It can't contain repeats. That's what we proved here. Okay, And since you've only got a finite number of things and you've got the exact number of slots in this row that you've got things in the integral domain, everything must appear once. So in particular, 1 must have to appear at some point. And then you just ask, well, what is it that I multiply by a uh, well, with a, rather, uh, to get 1, and that, of course, will be our multiplicative inverse for a. So there will have to exist some element which I can multiply with a to get 1, basically, if we're working in a finite integral domain, and that element will now be the multiplicative inverse of the element a. And that applies for absolutely all non-zero uh, a's that you can come up with from the integral domain. It only doesn't work for zero because, of course, we know that this uh, fact about the rows and columns uh, doesn't hold true when we're talking about zero. Okay, so that's the simple explanation as to why, if you have a finite integral domain, that has to be a field. Okay, it's because all of the rows and columns corresponding to elements that are uh, not equal to zero in the integral domain have to contain uh, all elements once and only once if we're working in a finite integral domain. Okay, um, if we're working in an infinite integral domain, I will stress again, this does not have to apply, and the reason is that saying that you can't have repeats in one of these rows or one of these columns um, doesn't mean that every element has to appear in the row or column, okay? Because if you've got infinity, an infinite number of elements, then of course infinite set theory comes into the play here, and infinite set theory is very different from finite set theory, okay? So it's only when we're working with a finite integral domain that we can then show that it has to be equal to a field. Okay, so finite integral domains are all fields. Okay, that's theorem number two, and with that I will end this basic introductory video on integral domains.